Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church. This is our Thanksgiving service. We're happy to have you join us on YouTube. We'd be happy to have you come anytime during our services. This is our Thanksgiving services, Tuesday the 25th of November, 6.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. We have food at the front at the altar, and this is uh, going to be given out uh, to the homeless people that we feed 8,000 meals a month. This uh, is just part of it, but uh, tonight we're having a special Thanksgiving service. We thanks be to God that we're children of God, and we're brothers and sisters, and we give thanksgiving to the wonderful things, the blessings that God has showered upon us this, this year, that we have Him, we have Jesus within us, comes into our hearts. We're happy to have you with us. Our pastor's pastor, John Pollock. Our choir director is Vicki Perks. We have the choir here this evening. We have our Thanksgiving service, and we're happy to have you join us. We're at the corner of Wittenberg and Columbia. We have services at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning and at 10.30 on Sunday morning. And this is our special Thanksgiving service.
In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us now turn to him, number 807, in the back of our worship books, and after a brief intro by the choir, we will then be instructed to join in the singing of Come Now, Father, of everyone else. This is a hymn that's written by uh, Robert Robinson, lived 1735 through 1790. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, your generous goodness comes to us new every day. By the work of your Spirit, lead us to acknowledge your goodness, give thanks for your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we listen to the reading of God's Word. Our reading from Deuteronomy. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs, and underground waters, welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and from whose hill you may mine copper. A land you shall eat your fill. And bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to commit to, commit, to keep his commandments, his ordinance, and his statutes. While I am commanding you today, when you have eaten your fill, and you have built fine houses and live in them. And when you and when your herds and flocks have multiplied, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and that all that you have is multiplied, then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness. An arid wasteland with poisonous snakes and scorpions. He made water flow for you from flint rock and fed you and fed you in the wilderness with men that your ancestors did not know, to humble you and to test you, and in the end to do you good. Do not say to yourself, My power and the might of my own hands have gotten me this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, so that He may confirm His covenant that He has sworn to your ancestors, as He is doing today. The word of the Lord.
A reading from 2 Corinthians. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad. He gives to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the seller and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for great generosity which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ, and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others. While they long for you, pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanksgiving service, November 25th, 2014, St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio.
Thank you, Lord, for numbering me among your children. Thank you, Lord, for making salvation through grace and faith and not by having to do works and trying to earn it like the religions of the world. And so tonight, we can learn some important lessons from that Samaritan because he is so much an example of what we Christians, we followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, are to be like in our daily lives. Once again, we turn to that 17th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, and focusing in on verses 15 and 16, we read, Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. He turned back. The word, Greek word translated as turn back is a Greek word that more often than not literally means to return home. When we come to Jesus, we return home. When we take time to praise and give thanks to Jesus, we are returning home. When we in our daily lives take that time to say a little prayer to Jesus or recite the Lord's Prayer or pull out a pocket Bible or a New Testament and read a bit of God's Word, we are returning home. When we gather together Sunday mornings and Wednesdays during Lent or during the week or whenever there's a service at the church, when we gather around Word and Sacrament, we're returning home. The Samaritan was returning home to Jesus. Returning home to a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Returning home to salvation. And he wanted everyone to know about it. For it says he came praising God. Now that word praising God means to magnify someone. It means to celebrate them. It means to hold them in great honor. It means to acknowledge their worth and dignity. The Samaritan was doing all this with Jesus. Honoring him, celebrating him, magnifying him, acknowledging his worth and his dignity. And that is what we do as followers of Jesus Christ in our daily lives. We honor God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We celebrate them. We praise their dignity and the worthy of them. We do this whenever we acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. And it is our responsibility to constantly give praise and to not be intimidated by a society that would prefer we be quiet. But instead we praise God just as the first two of the Ten Commandments tell us. That first commandment, I am the Lord your God, you shall have other God before him. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust God above all things. So that's putting God as a priority. That's meaning God is the most important thing in your life. God is more important than popularity. God is more important than being elected to something. God is more important than power. God is more important than prestige. God is more important than 15 minutes of fame. God is most important. When he's most important, you're magnifying him. You're celebrating him. You're honoring him. You're holding him in, him in honor. You're showing that he is worthy and, and worthy of dignity and praise. The second commandment says we shall not take the name of the Lord our God in vain. Or in a more modern translation, the way they put it is you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name. But call upon him in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. That is how we are to use God's name. But unfortunately, sometimes we give in to the pressure of those around us who are ridiculing God, are making fun of God's name, are not upholding it with the dignity and, and the worth it should be. I remember back in the late 70s, there was a joke that became popular. And this joke was a joke that in its own way was being disrespectful of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was desecrating his great sacrifice. I'm sure most of you, if you were around in the 70s, heard the joke. It was a joke taking, taking place on that first Good Friday. 
Jesus is on that cross dying for the sins of the world. And as a joke goes, Jesus is on the cross and suddenly he yells out, Peter, Peter. Of course, if you know anything about your Christian faith, you know Peter wasn't there at Calvary. Peter was all high. Big mouth Peter. Oh, Lord, I'll stand by you no matter what. Everybody else can fall away, but I'll be by you. Well, he was high. Only John was there. But in this joke, Jesus is saying, Peter, Peter. And Peter fights through the crowd to get up to the cross. And when he gets to the cross, Jesus looks down at Peter and says, Peter, I can see your house from here. That's desecrated in the sacrifice of Jesus. What's funny about it? How is that funny? But that was a popular joke because I've been told by Christians. Feeling the pressure of society that says, don't take your faith so seriously. And yet, the Samaritan shows us that we praise God. That means we hold him and our Lord Jesus Christ in honor. And show that they are worthy and they acknowledge their worth and dignity. That we don't use them as a butt of a joke. Especially not making a joke about that sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ in the first place. When our Lord Jesus Christ, totally innocent of any sin, took upon himself all the sins of the world that had taken place, were taking place, and would take place until his return. Taking those all upon himself. Shedding his blood for them so that like, we might be his own and live under him in his kingdom. And so we learn from the Samaritan to praise God. To praise him in that understanding of his Greek word. To magnify him. To celebrate him. To hold him in honor. To show that he is worthy of all praise and worthy of dignity. That he is not the butt of jokes. That he is the true Lord and Savior of us all. Then we read that the Samaritan gave thanks. That word thanks literally means to be grateful. We gather together to show to God that we are grateful. This night, for this nation he has given us, that we are grateful for his plan of salvation, which saves us. That we are grateful for the fact that we have life itself. Grateful that we're able to gather together as the children of God. Gathering together in that assurance of the forgiveness of sin and the promise of everlasting life. We gather together in grateful, with grateful hearts because of all that Jesus has done for us. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, St. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Rejoice, St. Paul is telling us. That's what the Samaritan was doing. He was rejoicing that he had been healed. That not only was he healed physically, but he was healed spiritually. If you look closely at this gospel lesson, you will notice it said that nine were cleansed, but the Samaritan was healed. Contrasting the difference, the nine received cleansing of their lepers, but the Samaritan was healed not just physically, but spiritually. Remember, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. The Samaritans were considered outcasts. The uh, Samaritans were considered traitors to Judaism. The Samaritans were considered to be like half-breeds. And yet here, the Samaritan is healed in his relationship with God. He's healed with his relationship with God because of his faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done. And so he rejoices. He is grateful. As we are grateful for being sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, as we are grateful to be able to live in this great nation and to have a national day of thanksgiving where we take time to give thanks and praise to Almighty God. Some of you, or most of you, I think, gathered here except for the young ones. 
I'm sure in Sunday school we learned about Polycarp, one of the early Christian martyrs. Polycarp learned at the knee of St. John. And St. John was an old man. Polycarp was a youngster. And it's said that when Polycarp became a man and began to have positions in the church, that he oftentimes talked about the, what he learned from St. John and the discussions with St. John. Polycarp was a bishop of Smyrna, and he was so loved by his people that as he became older, the congregation began to kind of have a rivalry as who could do the most for, for him, who could provide for him the most as he grew older. When he was 86, he was found and captured by the Romans as a traitor to the empire. He was brought into the arena to be burned at the stake. He was given one last chance to recant his faith in Jesus Christ. Polycarp said, for 86 years I have served him, and he has never done me any wrong. How could I now recant my Lord, my King, and my Savior? So they tied him to the stake, they lit the fire, and the wind came and blew the fire away so that it did not harm Polycarp. So then the governor ordered a soldier to run Polycarp through with a sword as he relit the flame, relit the fire. As the fire began to burn again, Polycarp, the blood so much emptied from his body, put the flames out. But then once he exhaled his final breath, then they relit the fire, and this time, his body was burned. But Polycarp was so grateful to Jesus that he would not take away out. He could have said with his lips, oh, I renounce Jesus, but in his heart still really believed in him and, and gone on. But he was so grateful to everything Jesus had done. For 86 years I had served him, and he has never done me any wrong. Why would I denounce him now? And so we, as St. Paul tells us, are to have me have rejoicing hearts, to be glad, to be delighted. The fact that we are called through the gospel by the Holy Spirit, that we have been baptized and brought into the church of our living Lord, Jesus Christ. And then the word thanksgiving that he uses here. Here it means to give thanks for God's blessing. Say every day, not only do you rejoice, but every day you give thanks for God's blessing. No matter how big, no matter how small, that everyone has blessings that they should be thankful for. Blessing that for nothing else. Being able to open our eyes and to breathe and experience another day that the Lord has made. Every day won't go perfect. Everything we do will not be a success. Some dreams and goals we have will never take place. But that doesn't mean we don't have blessings. That doesn't mean every day we still don't give blessings to God for what he has done. And that is what Abraham Lincoln meant, meant when he made his proclamation in October of 1863, establishing the National Day of Thanksgiving. Beginning with our first president, George Washington, presidents had a proclaimed a day of thanksgiving, but it never had been made a national holiday, and it never really was practiced throughout the, then what made up the United States. Of course, with Washington, it was the first 13 colonies, plus then uh, Kentucky and Tennessee were at it while he was president, and then it began, the country grew more as Ohio and Indiana came into the Union, and then more states. But it, until Lincoln's proclamation, Thanksgiving had never been a national holiday. But here Abraham Lincoln is in October of 1863. The horrible war between the states is raging. It'd go on for another year and a half. Up until the summer of 1863, in the East, the Union Army had suffered one defeat after another at the hands of General Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia. Now in the West, the Union had been quite successful under the leadership of General Grant and General Sherman. But then in the summer of 1863, two major events happened. Lee was turned back at Gettysburg, Grant, and Grant, the day later, Grant captures Vicksburg, cutting the Confederacy in half, giving control 
of the Ohio and Mississippi and every other waterway to the Union so that no longer did the South have any way to shuttle troops or supplies back and forth by waterway. And so in that October, Lincoln gives us this proclamation. He says, we have been recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved, or preserved assessment years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever known. And then he says these words that sound very apropos for today. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blossoms were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It has seemed to me fit and proper that God should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens and ever part of the United States and those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. Thanksgiving Day. Not a word about pilgrims and Native Americans. Not a word about turkeys and pumpkin pie. The whole emphasis is on being like that Samaritan who came back to give thanks and praise to Jesus. The whole proclamation is about taking a day as a nation, as a whole, whether Protestant or Catholic, Christian or Jew, at the time in 1863, would all stop and fill their houses of worship to give thanks to God for the many blessings. Even though the war was still raging, there were reasons to give thanks to God for the blessing that America had. And so we follow the example of the Samaritan. And we give thanks and praise to God. We are grateful. We give God the blessing. No matter what may happen in life, we still have reason to give thanks. There's a story told, I don't know if it's ever it's actually a cartoon or, or just in a book about peanuts, but the story about Snoopy, Thanksgiving Day. Snoopy's getting dog food for his Thanksgiving dinner, just as he always does. And Snoopy knows that Charlie Brown and all his family are inside him and turkey and all the trimmings. And he's like, you know, it's Thanksgiving, why am I getting just dog food? So he thinks about that and he says, how about that? Everyone is eating turkey today, but just because I'm a dog, I get dog food. <laughs> so then after meditating about it for a few more minutes, he trots over to his most famous position that we know of Snoopy, and that's sitting on top of his doghouse. And as he sits on his doghouse, he concludes, of course, it could have been worse. I could have been born a turkey. <laughs> that is the, the way we are to look at every day as followers of Jesus Christ. No matter how bleak the day may be, no matter how dreary the weather, no matter how out of sorts the weather may be, January weather in November, no matter what didn't go right for that day, no matter how bad you burned the crust of the pie or the turkey, whatever. There is always reasons to give blessings to God. No matter what the situation, because as old Snoopy said, it could be worse. You could have been born a turkey. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Would you please turn to page 104 in the front of your worship book to the words of the Nicene Creed. And with the whole church, we profess it.
Time for our offering. This is the 25th of November, St. John's Lutheran Church. This is their Thanksgiving service. Following the offering, we'll have Holy Communion, Great Thanksgiving, Sanctus, which is the Holy, 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 Eucharistic Prayer, Lord's Prayer, Agnus Dei, which is the Lamb of God, a distribution and blessing, the post communion canticle, post communion prayer, the benediction, and the recessional hymn will be the Thanksgiving medley. Then we'll be dismissed. This is our Thanksgiving service. We're praising God, our Father. We're thanking Him for His blessings, for His favor that He's shown to us and all the wonderful things that have happened to us. We've recounted them, the choir sang about them, and we're spending this hour thanking God for our country, for our Savior, for our salvation, for Jesus Christ our Lord.
believe his body, blood, are truly present as we gather this table in our community age and our own individual congregation. You're invited and encouraged to come forward with us this day as we gather to take Lord. We continue our celebration with the great thanksgiving on page 107 in the front of your worship. The Lord be with
Members of St. John's congregation are receiving the real presence, body and blood of Jesus Christ. Our pastor is Pastor Pollock, and we are giving thanks to God, Thanksgiving service. This is the 25th of November, 2014. Body of our Lord Jesus Christ, in his precious blood, strengthen, preserve your true faith unto life and truth. Thanksgiving service. 
This is St. John's Lutheran Church, corner of Wittenberg in Columbia. We're, we'll pray for you and we ask you to pray for us and watch us on YouTube.